Okay, you do you hear me? Yeah, okay, so it should be on. Okay, so I would like also welcome everybody here <coughs> uh, in Prague at this school. And uh, I hope we will have a good uh, week. Uh, uh, the schedule is on the webpage uh, as for Saturday. The schedule is a little bit uncertain because uh, we will have uh, the last set of lectures by uh, Nima Arkani Hamed. And, uh, uh, it's possible that they will uh, kind of go in the night, so uh, so we don't have really end. Uh, uh, we had, we don't have an official ending on the school, but of course you will be free to leave uh, to get some sleep. And uh, uh, I guess <clears throat> when the number of people drop below <laughs> certain threshold, we just we just uh, finish the school. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I'm sure you all uh, know a little bit about scattering amplitudes, but uh, also there are more junior people here, uh, more senior who, who are already working on projects. So we decided to have some very introductory lectures. So it's possible for many of you, this will be completely elementary that you already learned several years ago. Uh, but maybe for some others, this will be useful. So just to set some kind of uh, <clears throat> common ground before going to more, uh, uh, more detailed and more interesting lectures by Henrik, Lenz, uh, Svi, Johannes, and uh, Nima, and Cheikh when they arrive later this week. Uh, we will have some introductory lectures. Uh, I will uh, do three, and Shruti, uh, who's here, will also do three. We divided the topics uh, in some way to cover uh, kind of all the basics. And yeah, let's see, so had, let's see how quickly it goes. Uh, as uh, as Carol already mentioned, if I'm very slow, then we swap with Shruti. I take uh, two lectures in a row because I need to finish some material before uh, she can start. Okay, and of course, uh, please ask me, you can just raise your hand, please ask any questions if something is unclear or uh, you have any uh, comments. All right, so uh, 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 the... Of course, the topic of uh, <laughs> these lectures and the school is uh, scattering amplitudes in quantum field theory. And this will be just some very gentle introduction with the emphasis of uh, kind of more modern formalism, so things that we are actually using. Uh, to, to calculate amplitudes, and some of it will be definitely useful also for the remaining talks. So here uh, we talk about an amplitude, which is some function of momenta of particles and some spin information, which describes a process of uh, some particles going in and particles going out. Yeah, we typically, in amplitudes, we take all particles incoming because we can always reverse uh, outgoing and incoming. So, um, and uh, we would like to calculate the probability of some initial states going to some final states, in states going to out state. And uh, this object scattering amplitude exa exactly describes that for a given initial state and for a given final state. And uh, the thing that is then actually measured at uh, uh, colliders or uh, other experiments is the cross-section, which is, uh, uh, roughly speaking, square of the amplitude, or the differential cross-section is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Yeah, we will be not interested in uh, really in uh, uh, calculating this object, but we will stick with the amplitude. But once we have amplitude, uh, we can, with some effort, uh, calculate the cross-sections as well. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, now, uh, you, I guess many of you already had some quantum field theory classes or read quantum field theory textbooks. So in any textbook, uh, you find a recipe uh, how to calculate scattering amplitudes. Which is start with the Lagrangian. So I just write some Lagrangian for let's say scalar fields, scalar phi to the four theory. Or we can have different Lagrangian, uh, so this is phi to the four, Lagrangian for QED. Uh, 
Okay, and once we have Lagrangian, uh, there, there is a direct way how to derive Feynman rules, which are kind of the building blocks for which are building blocks for Feynman diagrams, uh, which is the way how we organize uh, the calculation of scattering amplitudes. So Feynman rules, so for example, for, for the scalar theory, for phi to the four, we have to derive Feynman rule for uh, just uh, the, the, the free propagation, just for the propagator, and then for the interaction vertex. For QED, we have more interesting things. <coughs> we have propagation of uh, the fermion, we have propagation of the photon, and uh, then we have also interaction of uh, uh, both of them. Okay, so from these Feynman rules, we construct Feynman diagrams. which are diagrammatic pictures, uh, which tell us how the interactions, how the process, uh, how the scattering can happen. So for, our, for my first example, we can have this diagram, so the particles can just scatter and meet at a point, but we can have also more complicated diagrams, or even more complicated. <laughs> And of course, for, for QED, there is a lot of different possibilities. Okay, these Feynman diagrams are naturally organized in uh, the expansion. Okay, okay. So, uh, we organize the calculation of scattering amplitudes in perturbation theory, so if coupling is small, this is where we can use the Feynman diagrams. If the coupling is big, then of course we are in big trouble and we have to use some other methods. Uh, then uh, uh, we can expand along, uh, uh, we can expand in a small coupling and we can use perturbation theory. For the scattering amplitude and uh, Then uh, we have the contributions of the simplest Feynman diagrams, which are tree. Yeah, this is an example of the tree Feynman diagram. There is no internal loop in this diagram. And uh, then uh, there are things which are subleading. If the coupling is small, this is multiplied by certain power. Let's say this is multiplied. Okay, if I say that the coupling is called G, so this is, for example, multiplied by G, this is multiplied by G square, this is a one loop amplitude, G cube. Two-loop amplitude. The particular powers of G depends. Yeah, how exactly the G shows up in the Lagrangian. And uh, yeah, and uh, as uh, as we here show the Feynman diagram. So the example of the Feynman diagram would be this one. This is three. This is one loop. This is two loop for the phi to the four theory. Okay. And uh, yeah, here here the. Uh, here the powers of G exactly corresponds to putting G in each vertex. Okay, now uh, if the coupling is small, then the tree level amplitude should be dominant, sub uh, and subleading, subleading, and sub subleading. But of course, the amplitudes have some problems because they suffer from divergencies. So we have to be careful. Uh, the tree level amplitude are always finite. These are just rational functions that you can derive uh, using Feynman rules. But uh, the loop amplitudes are much more complicated functions. There is a loop integral to be done. You have to integrate over the moment of the internal loop. And this uh, can cause divergencies. So the loop amplitudes can be both IR divergent when it comes from uh, the regions when the momentum is small, or proportional to external momenta, or UV divergence, which comes from the regions when the momentum is large.
So in order to make some uh, reasonable uh, calculations and predictions, we have to regulate. So we have to choose a regulator. And uh, one choice, the dimensional regularization, then instead of doing the calculation in the four dimension, we shift the dimension uh, a little bit, and that regulates uh, uh, <coughs> the divergences. Yeah. Ah, okay, v very good, yeah. So so here I just uh, relabel it, so G was lambda, okay, very nice, in my, uh, in my uh, calculation, yeah. So here I did a specific example here, I just wanted to do the general thing, but yeah, the coupling constant always shows up in the Lagrange. Okay, well, he is <laughs> kind of not in these diagrams, I would have to draw a different expansion. Yeah, G is E square in case I did it for QED, yeah. So in our examples that we use above, indeed, G is lambda and G is E square. Despite the kind of the diagrams that would show up would be a little different, but the scaling of the tree, scaling of the one loop, indeed, as Henrik said, would be G is E square. Okay, uh, very good. So uh, this is kind of uh, just uh, a general setup because uh, I guess details on all of these things, uh, yeah, uh, is the content of all the QFT textbooks. But we will uh, here would like to uh, <clears throat> do some more modern methods or some some things which are usually not in the textbooks and that uh, uh, pe people use in the calculations of scattering amplitudes. And uh, <clears throat> to start with that, uh, we will. Uh, talk, uh, at least in, in my part, we will talk about amplitudes uh, which are massless. So, uh, so massless particles. This is mostly for uh, convenience. From the other point of view, uh, there are many particles in the standard model which are massless. And in addition, if we talk about scattering at very high energies, uh, the energies of uh, these processes are typically much higher than uh, the masses of particles, so we can freely neglect, in many cases, the masses even of particles which are massive. So, so in the, that approximation, we can talk about massless particles. But of course, uh, yeah, one can definitely also consider masses, but <clears throat> for the, what I want to, to discuss now, uh, we will focus on massless particles. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to show one uh, Example of a general, more general phenomenon when uh, if you follow the standard Feynman diagram uh, uh, prescription to how to calculate scattering amplitudes, you get some very complicated intermediate objects. You have to evaluate the Feynman diagrams using Feynman rules. There are also a lot of Feynman diagrams. But in the end, we often get a very simple result, which is, and the simplicity is obscure at the level of these Feynman diagrams. And uh, this is also how uh, was one uh, of the early evidence that there is something nice in, uh, in the structure of scattering amplitudes. And this goes back to the 1985 and the calculation of uh, Park-Taylor amplitude. So I'm sure many of you heard about Park-Taylor before, but let me <clears throat> just uh, review what was done. And uh, yeah, this uh, led to uh, uh, further progress. So uh, here, uh, the task was to calculate uh, the amplitude of uh, six gluons in uh, QCD. As you probably know, QCD is a theory for strong interactions. It has uh, the gluons are. Uh, uh, are particles which mediate uh, the strong interactions uh, between uh, quarks. And uh, if you do scattering of protons and LHC and so on, this is a very important part of the calculation. In order to make the predictions, you have to be able to calculate uh, these gluonic amplitudes to uh, high precision, high multiplicity, high, high loop order. And this was exactly the case in 1985 when uh, uh, there was a plan for a uh, new collider back then, uh, and uh, 
from the theor from the theoretical point of view, it was important to calculate uh, amplitudes of of the gluons uh, to very high multiplicity. This was even at tree level. So let me just say this is uh, tree level calculation. And this was driven by the experimental need. Yeah, unfortunately, the the collider was not built uh, in the end. But uh, uh, these two people, Park and Taylor, uh, finished that calculation and uh, found something surprising. So let me just uh, say that uh, from the point of view of the Feynman diagrams, the standard uh, method uh, to calculate such an amplitude, you just have to draw all Feynman diagrams which have six legs external at tree level. And this is uh, 220 Feynman diagrams. OK. And uh, with certain way of counting them. And uh, yeah, as you can imagine, there are many of them. Uh, now, for those who are not familiar with QCD, let me say that uh, here, uh, the Lagrangian uh, of QCD has gluons and quarks. And if you only look at the gluons, which is what we would like to do at tree level, there is no exchange of quarks. We have two Feynman diagrams. One is three point, and the other one is four point. So diagrammatically, it is draw all diagrams which have three point and four point vertices. Yeah, with certain labeling of the momenta. So you can imagine that there are many of them because you can combine these three point and four point vertices to draw uh, a lot of different diagrams. Yes. 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 Yeah, we will actually, uh, I will go back to it a little later. This is motivational, but yeah, indeed. So this is, uh, this is G, this is G square. And if you calculate four point amplitude, there would be two contributions, this contribution and this contribution. Yeah, so this will have G, G, this is G square, this is G square directly. So they will be at the same. Yeah, always, yeah, when you do these calculations, they, they are, there is the kind of overall power of, uh, of, uh, of the coupling constant, which just corresponds uh, to, to, to the product of coupling constants in the individual vertices. Yeah, we will then kind of start from the beginning and do more detailed calculations of 3.4 point amplitudes. But I just wanted to here motivate uh, uh, where, uh, that even with the calculations, which looks very complicated and very messy, we surprisingly get some uh, simple result. And indeed, if you evaluate these 220 Feynman diagrams, what uh, by plugging uh, formulas uh, for these vertices and getting some large rational functions, we, you get something like 100 pages <coughs> of uh, algebra. And by algebra, I mean things which look like this, epsilon dot p, where epsilon is a polarization vector, and p is the momentum of particles, and you get different products, like uh, that for various particles. Yeah, so this is also indices. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's a huge, uh, huge formula. However, after you sum all these diagrams, and you ch choose some particular helicities, uh, so you calculate an helicity amplitude, uh, the whole thing shrinks into a single line formula. So, so the Park-Taylor formula for six points for some particular helicity. So two of the particles, let's say, we choose to have minus helicity, four of them plus, is just a single line formula. When these brackets are spinner helicity variables, I will just introduce in a second, yeah? Uh, but this is a motivation uh, that uh, uh, first, uh, amplitudes in the end are much simpler than you would think just from the Feynman diagrams. And second, actually choosing some good variables uh, 
makes uh, the simplicity manifest. Okay, so uh, uh, so let's now start with the discussing of the spinner helicity variable. So now we kind of start uh, from the beginning, and uh, in order to make some progress, we have to choose the right variables for massless particles. Okay, so you can always uh, uh, note that uh, <clears throat> for massless particles, uh, we have always four momenta, uh, or for any particles, not just massless, p mu, and uh, the four momentum squares to zero, because p square equals m square, and for massless, it's zero. But uh, there are better variables which uh, store the same degrees of freedom as the four momentum p mu. So four momentum p mu has four degrees of freedom in four dimensions. And uh, we have one condition which says that p square equals m square equals zero. So we have only three degrees of freedom left. Yeah. And we would like to store these three degrees of freedom in a different way, which would be useful for our calculations. OK, so for that, uh, we use an object which shows up in the massless Dirac equation. So let me just remind you. So the massless Dirac equation, we can write in a following way, p slash v plus minus equals zero, where uh, this v plus minus are for the incoming particles. And analogously, we can also write u bar uh, plus minus v slash is equals to zero which are, these are, uh, these are incoming uh, fermions, and uh, these are outgoing uh, incoming anti-fermions. And they are related, of course, so the relation is that u plus plus minus is equal to v uh, minus plus, and uh, v plus minus bar is equal to u bar minus plus. Yeah, this makes sense because uh, incoming outgoing yeah, changes, uh, changes the helicity. Okay, so this is uh, just yeah, yeah, some notation for the massless Dirac equation for spin uh, one half particles. But uh, from this, we can write uh, <coughs> the solutions uh, for uh, two independent spinners here. So, of course, these, these objects are called spinners. There are two component uh, <coughs> representations of the Lorentz group. SV plus uh, lambda A dot, zero, and V minus zero lambda A. Okay, so the V's are four component, the, the P's are also four component, yeah, P slash is just the standard contractions with the gamma matrices. So this is four component, four component, these are all four components. But the, so in, order to write a, uh, in order to be a solution of a Dirac equation, you can write them in a following way when the first two components are given by the, here the lambda tilde spinner and then zero, and here the first two components by zero and then the lambda spinner. Yeah, so the lambda uh, a lambda tilde a dot are two component spinners. Okay, and uh, <coughs> these two spinners are exactly the kinematical data in the momentum p mu. So the p mu can be written using uh, these spinners in a following way. Uh, 
Okay, we're gonna write a a dot. Okay, so P is a vector four component vector. We can use uh, Pauli matrices to instead of a f one index which is four components to write two pairs of indices which are two component, and then the P mu becomes a product of lambda and lambda tilde, which are exactly these objects which show up in uh, the parametrizations of these spinners. Okay, so this is another way how to parametrize the four momentum. So instead of one four vector, we have two spinners, lambda and lambda tilde. Yeah? And this division, this way of uh, rewriting, uh, yeah, uh, will be extremely useful for writing our scattering amplitudes. And, uh, okay. So. Okay. So any questions so far? Yes. So yeah, so the, the upper lower indices are done just with the epsilon two by two antisymmetric tensor. Yeah, so you can raise them and, ah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, right, so, so here I wrote it as the lower indices, you are right. We, we, we would raise them with the antisymmetric epsilon tensor. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so another way how to look at it is following how to kind of arrive uh, 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 at uh, this uh, representation of the of the momentum. is following. So uh, we have, uh, again, the four momentum P mu as P0, P1, P2, P3. And we also know that P square equals uh, <coughs> P0 square uh, plus P1 square plus P2 square minus P3 square. So depending exactly what type of uh, uh, metric you use. So here I use the one, the one with uh, the P3 having the minus sign. And uh, then we can also write just the components of P in a matrix. Okay, so I define a matrix. So this is very similar to, to what I was then doing before. And uh, write Using uh, the Pauli matrices, store the information about P0, P1, P2, P3 in a two by two matrix. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and now, if I take, uh, if I calculate the determinant of this matrix, PAB. I find just this formula. I find that this is equal to P0 square plus P1 square plus P2 square minus P3 square, and this is equal to zero. Okay, so the determinant of this matrix is, is equal to P square, and that is zero. And uh, if the matrix has determinant zero, you can just write it as the product of two vectors, right? So then PAB, we can also write as some <coughs> lambda A kappa B. But this is just talking about uh, the uh, 
talking just about the matrices. So this is exactly the representation that we get here when if I use the dot dotted representation, this will become the lambda tilde spinner. But this just shows the fact that the, the massless kinematics factorizes. Yeah, you can, instead of one four vector, you can talk about uh, uh, here two spinners. And now how to turn the PAB as a matrix back into the four momentum is again using uh, these Pauli matrices. So there are two ways uh, how to look at this, uh, uh, this change of variables yeah, be, uh, between uh, <coughs> four momenta and spinner helicity variables. Okay. Okay, so we will use these lambda lambda tilde. So this is our uh, data. Uh, so if we have a scattering process, the momenta uh, for each particle will be given by the lambda lambda tilde spinners. Now note that we have massless particles. And I already mentioned that we have only uh, three degrees of freedom in P, right? Because the P mu has three independent components. Now the lambda lambda tilde, each of them have two components. So how is it possible? We have here three, but then we have only two. But know that when we write the P mu using, uh, uh, using uh, lambda lambda tilde for, for a particle, you can always do a rescaling. You can, uh, rescale lambda and rescale lambda tilde in the opposite way. such that both of them change. However, the momentum doesn't change. Yeah, so the momentum is invariant. So this leaves uh, this leaves uh, the momentum invariant. Yeah, so this is also called a little group scaling. Yeah, because uh, yeah, uh, in the context, if you write the momentum for the uh, for the uh, massless particles, and in the rest frame, uh, uh, you can write it as e zero zero e, and then there is an SO two rotation, uh, which leaves the momentum invariant, and this is exactly can be transformed or. Uh, <clears throat> This degree of freedom can be written in this way using the spinner helicity variables. You can see here, this is some U1, uh, U1 rotation, which leaves the momentum invariant, but changes uh, the lambda and lambda tilde. So if you have an expression which depends on lambda, lambda tilde, they would change if you do the little red rescaling. However, the momentum does not change. Yeah? So if we talk about the momentum, that doesn't change. Okay, now I was here a little silent about uh, if things are real or complex, yeah, which is an important part. So uh, let's first look at it. Uh, the momentum the for momentum P, for some purposes, it can be complex. Yeah, so it's a complex momentum in C4. It has four complex components. But if you want to describe the real world, then the momentum is always real. Yeah, so the momentum PM is real, <clears throat> which means that uh, if we complex conjugate P, we just get P, okay? Now, what is the implication to lambda lambda tilde? Because we, I just said that we would like to use this lambda lambda tilde to describe our kinematics rather than the momentum itself. So for spinner, helicity variables. It has following implication. So 
it, uh, the fact that the momentum is real, that we have this condition, implies that we, if we complex conjugate lambda, we just get lambda tilde. OK? So for complex momenta, the lambda lambda tilde are independent and complex. OK? For real momenta, the lambda tilde is a complex conjugate of lambda. However, they are still complex. Yeah, they are not real. Yeah? So in order to get a real momentum, you need to have this relation, but just having in mind that both lambda lambda tilde are complex. Yeah? So here they are conjugate but complex. In other words, if you would like to build the real momentum from uh, lambda lambda tilde, you have to satisfy this condition. And then automatically your mom form momentum is uh, real. OK. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Judge the uh, Lorentz group. Well, uh, well, uh, so we have real momentum, right? So the SO3 one is for the real. I'm just saying that in principle, you can, and for many cases it is useful, but let me just not talk about it. It's, uh, you can think about moment as complex, and then the lambda and lambda tilde will be independent and complex. Yeah. So they will have four, well, four, minus one, so three complex degrees of freedom. However, if our, but in quantum field theory, if you want to describe the scattering of particles, moment are real, yeah? So the question here is how the reality of the momentum, what is the implication on lambda lambda tilde? Now, naive implication might be, okay, maybe the lambda lambda tilde are real, but that's not true, yeah? They are not real, yeah? However, they are complex conjugate. So that's the implication of having a real momentum. Yeah, so, uh, so we just stick with that. So if you think about lambda lambda tilde, you think about uh, the lambda tilde being a complex conjugate of lambda because it only this condition guarantees that your momentum is real if you want to have the real momentum. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, 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 there can be plus minus sign, yeah, depending on the energy. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the author because, okay, I am here going with one uh, <laughs> particular notation. Uh, you will probably find if you read some papers and so on that uh, not all uh, notations are same. Yeah, so you have to be a little careful, especially if you see signs or eyes and things like that, that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they depend on the author. Yes, yes. Kind of SL2C, SL which is for the complex, yeah. So of course, if you, yeah, if you go between real and complex, yeah, you are changing the SL2R uh, or SL2C to SL2R. That was, that's the original one. Yeah, that's the original one. If everything is complex, then it's SL2C cross SL2C. Yes, yeah. If you complexify it, if you complexify it, yeah. We started with completely complex things. We said nothing about the real, yeah. And uh, then, uh, then, uh, uh, then when we talk about the real momentum, when you have SO3-1, yeah, you have to go to SL2C. But the original one in the complexified version, we just had SL2C cross SL2C because the lambda and lambda tilde had nothing to do with each other a priori. Okay, excellent, excellent. Very good questions. Uh, 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 right, so, so, so I consider here everything incoming. Yeah, so everything in, um, incoming. Uh, so yeah, and everything what we are doing, of course, uh, if you have a real process, something is incoming and something is outgoing. Yeah, so you have to choose which particles are in and which are out, but uh, uh, you can always turn uh, the outgoing particle into incoming right? by, by changing the momentum and helicity. So in discussion of the amplitudes, we always consider, <coughs> or I consider, 
may other people don't consider, that all particles are incoming. Yeah? So everything is incoming because then I can choose what is incoming and outgoing and from that amplitude get any other amplitude in an easy way. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's SL, yeah, it's SL2C, yeah. Uh, so then my question is, can you see any No, that's a different, uh, so, uh, so here, yeah, if the particle is massive, then P square is not equal to zero. P square is M square, and you just cannot write it uh, using the spinner helicity variable. Or not, okay, there are also some extend, extension of the spinner helicity variables to massive, but it is more complicated, yeah? It is not just this simple thing. So the spinner helicity variables are only, are only for massless particles. Well, uh, well, at the level of, uh, yeah, so, so, so what, well, here we are talking about the momentum, right? So, so we are talking about the momentum and how to split the momentum, yeah, into two parts, yeah. So I'm just saying that for the momentum itself, if you have a massive momentum, P square is M square. So if you think here about uh, this matrix, so determinant of P, uh, P A B is P square, and this is M square. It's not zero, so you cannot factor it into to the pair of two vectors. So then here you can you cannot also write SO three one uh, as uh, as uh, as uh, two sets of S L two C for the uncomplexified for the complexified version. When you then impose the condition and just write it as SL2C, if you impose that condition on top of that, yeah. So for the massive momentum, you cannot do it like that. Yeah, again, there, there are sp massive spinner helicity variables, so in the end, you are able to, to do something about it, but it, is, uh, yeah, but it is not this clear split, yeah. In principle, okay, so maybe I can just mention, but this is not, uh, if there is an already question on that, <clears throat> if your P square is equal to M square, so you have, uh, 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 this is a massive particle. You can also use spinner helicity variables, but in a following way. You need basically two pairs of them. You need lambda, lambda, tilde, and then you need some eta, eta, tilde. And this is a lot of degrees of freedom. So then uh, you have to remove the degrees of freedom going, from, going from many degrees of freedom here down to four, yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, for massless, for massless, you can eliminate one of them and you just get lambda, lambda, tilde. Yes? Yeah. Of uh, massless Dirac equation, yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Because you, are so, you can think about it here opposite as solving for U and V. Yeah, and the solution for U and V is exactly this one, when the lambda and lambda tilde are the parts of the momentum P. Yeah, so there is a yeah well there is a two ways how to look at it. Yeah, you start with the spinners, and then you are looking if the momentum can be written using these spinners. But you can also start with the momentum like that and ask what is the solution for U and V, and the solution turns out to be this. Because that's the thing which satisfies massless Dirac equation. Okay, great, great questions. Thanks a lot for that. So what should we, okay, we have to erase the top one. Okay, 
So uh, now once we already wrote uh, the momentum using uh, the spinner helicity variables, we do, oh, where is my here? Uh, we will uh, <coughs> write some momentum invariance in terms of these spinner helicity variables because yeah, these will be expressions or these will be things that we will be, uh, we will be using later as well. So, <coughs> so if we have, again, massless particles, So p square is zero. We can have uh, Sij, which is just uh, pi plus pj square. So this is uh, i and j are momenta of two different particles. And uh, this we can also write as pi square plus uh, <coughs> Uh, 2 pi dot pj plus pj square. Okay, and uh, these are zero. Yeah, pi and pj are zero because we have massless particles. So uh, the this uh, the object that we would like to that we are left with is just the scalar product of pi and pj. Okay, so this is uh, just the scalar product. So now how to write it using these spinner helicity variables. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we have to represent the momentum pi using uh, our, yeah, the lambda lambda tilde, and we have to represent momentum pj using lambda lambda tilde. And then we take a scalar product. So the Lorentz index, which is carried by pi and pj, here is carried by sigma mu. So we will contract the Lorentz indices uh, over the, yeah, from the sigma mu. So we have sigma mu, a, a dot, and, uh, okay, let me just relabel it, this to p1 and p2, just to make it simpler to, uh, to use the notation. And uh, the momentum p1, is sigma mu a a dot lambda one a lambda tilde one a dot. So the one just no denotes that this is momentum one. And uh, uh, the P two is sigma mu. I put a lower index because we are contracting over them. Uh, B B dot and lambda two B lambda two B dot tilde. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now uh, things depend a bit on uh, precise notation. I put here two because the two exactly shows up in, in the Sij here. And uh, here I can contract the mu index between this sigma and this sigma. And uh, what I'm getting is uh, epsilon AB, epsilon A dot, B dot. Where epsilon is just two by two. Uh, anti-symmetric tensor, okay? And this is the one which like raises and lowers the spinner indices. So as a result, uh, the thing uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. So there is, uh, there is two here also. And with the two properly, I get these epsilon tensors. So uh, I am contracting the A indices. So I'm contracting an index from lambda one A and lambda 2b, so I write epsilon ab, lambda 1a, lambda 2b. That's the first object I get. And then I'm contracting the dotted indices between the lambda tildes. Epsilon a dot b dot lambda 1 dot tilde lambda tilde 2b dot. Okay, so here all the indices are contracted, but these are just Lorentz indices. Here we have contracted spinner indices. Okay, so, and <coughs> this uh, brings us to the definition of the angle and square bracket. So we define some notation here.
So we have, uh, we define uh, angle bracket one, two to be exact, exactly the epsilon contraction of spinners lambda one A and lambda two B. And we define the square bracket one, two as the contraction of uh, lambda tilde one spinner, lambda tilde two B spinner. Okay, so we just define these contractions as uh, lambda, lambda tilde. And then because of that, the S12 factorizes into product of two things. Okay, so in general, so now there is a big difference in 4D and general dimension. So in the general dimension, S12 is just a quadratic thing on the, uh, it's just some polynomial, which is quadratic in the components of momenta. Yeah, because this is P1 dot uh, P2, and uh, it is just some quadratic thing. However, in four dimensions, it does factorize in these spinner helicity variables into a product of angle bracket one, two, which is an epsilon contraction of uh, uh, the lambda spinners and square bracket one, two, which is an epsilon tilde, uh, which is an epsilon contraction of the lambda tilde spinners. Okay, uh, I need a few more minutes. <laughs> so, um, so we will use these uh, lambda, lambda, we will use these angle and uh, square brackets and uh, <clears throat> I, let, let me also just define, because you might see it later, that uh, there are also, you can also define a mixed bracket, and you, we will you will probably see it later when uh, uh, Schrute or uh, I show some recursion uh, relation formulas and so on. And uh, this is kind of a combination of the angle and square bracket. Uh, this thing inside is a momentum P, P2 plus P3, with uh, the spinner indices, not with uh, the uh, Lorentz indices. And uh, then you just dot one with two and two with four, and then you dot one with three and three with four, one with square bracket and the other with angle bracket. So if you, if you use also this, no, uh, if you see also this notation, this is kind of a mixed bracket of both uh, lambda and lambda tilde. Okay, very good. Uh, any question about uh, this? Now, one important thing uh, about the momenta <clears throat> is the momentum conservation. So if you have a scattering process, and as Henry correctly remind me, I have to specify what is incoming and outgoing as a notation. So here everything is incoming, which means that if I moment have momentum P1, P2, P3, up to Pn, then the sum of all momenta uh, from the momentum conservation for momentum conservation of, or the momentum and energy conservation in components, the sum of all momenta must be equal to zero. Okay, and <clears throat> if I decide instead of uh, this p mu, write, uh, write the momentum using the spinner helicity variables, I get a similar expression just for lambda, lambda, tilde. So lambda a, lambda a tilde. Now uh, this is for particle i, so let me just put i here on top. But I is not like it's not a Lorentz index or spinner index. This is just like a particle index, just labeling which particle it is, and this must be equal to zero, yeah. And uh, which means that this is equal to zero here as well. So the lambda and lambda tilde are not completely independent, yeah. Even modulo this uh, uh, little group rescaling, but they satisfy momentum conservation, yeah. So they are dependent variables, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> often uh, this is important to show different identities between them. Okay, so uh, maybe, yes. Yes. 
Well, it's a, compl it's a complicated question. First, uh, it is uh, not on shell because here we strictly work with on shell particles. Yeah, so whenever I write p square is m square, p square is zero. This is, means external particles are on shell. So the loop momentum is not on shell. This is an off shell momentum L. And uh, well, depending, uh, yeah, so uh, typically what we do, we construct the amplitude using different methods, Feynman diagrams, but also other methods you will hear later. And uh, then you have to integrate over L. But the amplitudes, as I said in the beginning, suffer from some problems. Yes, they suffer from UV divergences, but also IR divergences. And uh, the IR divergences are sensitive, but well, also UV, but IR divergences are especially sensitive if you are in four dimensions or not in four dimensions. So you have to use some regulator, which basically puts you outside four dimension. This is dimensional regularization, tells you that you have to go a little bit away, and this eps being epsilon away regulates the thing. So instead of infinity, you get one over epsilon. But if you set epsilon to zero, you back get infinity. Yeah, and yeah. So then, uh, then uh, the loop moment are not strictly in four dimensions. If you decide to do that, if you decide to take calculate the amplitude, integrate over the loop momenta, yeah, then you are away, and you have to do some treatment of that, yeah, because you are not in four dimensions strictly. Yeah, uh, the external our external momenta are always in four dimensions here. Yeah. Uh, here we are working in four dimensions. In some other cases, when the dimension is not that important, you can work in D dimensions. Yeah. So, for example, a lot of what uh, Henrik will talk about, about color kinematics, will work in D dimensions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I'm here talking uh, about, these new variables and so on, this is very specific to four dimensions. Only in four dimensions, what I'm saying here is possible. But the dimensionality kind of thing, d equals 4, d not equal to 4, is very important uh, in general in the, yeah, for, for different questions, and especially for this loop momenta, because as I said, in many cases, you just cannot integrate in four dimensions because you get infinities. You have to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, you might stay in four dimensions, but then you have to, for example, add a mass or something like that that uh, regulates things. But I think you will hear more about it from... Johannes Hen later uh, this week, where he talk about integration methods. Okay, great question. Yes. Yeah, you can do everything in D dimensions, uh, then you work with momenta. This is only in four dimensions, yeah. Well, the, the, there is something like spin or helicity variables also in six dimensions, but it's a little bit different, yeah. Let's say that what I am saying here works only strictly in four dimensions. If you would like to take a theory in D dimensions, yeah, you have to, you have to talk about momenta. You can set P square equals to zero, but it doesn't give you anything more special than that, yeah. It's just four momentum or D momentum with extra condition P square equals zero. In four dimensions, this implies more, yeah? The masslessness, the fact that V square equals zero implies more and implies the factorization, basically, of, uh, of uh, the degrees of freedom in, in the momenta. And yeah, and then it's very useful when you talk about helicity amplitudes and things I will talk uh, next lecture. Yeah. In, uh, if you are in D dimensions, you have these D dimensional momenta, as I said, V square equals zero, but that's it. And then you can talk about massless particles, and then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, and then you have to characterize the spin degrees of freedom and so on. So this is like a general discussion. Yeah, we are saying that for this specific case, there is more that can be done, and uh, it is useful to reveal certain things, simplicity, symmetries, and things like that, which are only specific for four dimensions. You. Uh, so everywhere we just at the beginning we said we are in massless particles. Just yeah, at some point I said, well, the, the kind of the beginning of the story with uh, like trees and loops and uh, perturbation theory and so on. This is general, but then at some point we uh, we said that we start here with massless particles when the kinematics part started. Yeah, then we restrict it to is massless that because particles. Because the helicity is invariant, or, or, or for example, you could probably generalize this this the whole helicity thing or this. Uh, 
to the massive particle. Is it is that possible or? Uh, no, no. Uh, so so here, yeah. So so that it was a statement about uh, about uh, the momenta. Yeah. So the momenta in four dimensions for massless particles have this special property of factorizing, or mm -hmm. you are being able to write it in terms of this lambda lambda tilde. If you don't have massless particles or you are outside four dimensions, you cannot do it like that. Yeah. You still have to talk about momentum. It gets more complicated, but you could probably do it, right? Or uh, that's the you can calculate amplitudes, okay. yeah, but you are not able to use these spinner helicity right. variables. Okay. Yeah, that's Thank it. You. Yeah, you can still use momenta. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you cannot calculate amplitudes outside d plus four and uh, with massive. You can, but yeah, this simplification is not present there. This is only present in d plus four for masses. Okay. Any more questions before the break? Okay, if not, we can probably go for the break. Thank you. Thank you.